Welcome to this video where we will continue exploring the role of blood vessels. This time we are moving away from the normal blood pressure and we will shift our focus on when and why issues arise with the blood pressure. We will also have a look of the control of blood flow. So let's get started. I want to begin by noting that there are many things that can affect one's blood pressure. These include individuals' age, sex, weight, even race, posture, amount of physical exercise that one is used to, emotions and mood, and the medical state of an individual. For example, whether a person has a fever or not will have an effect on the blood pressure. Let's consider two possible larger situations where the blood pressure is off from the normal. And we will start with hypertension. The key here is in the part that says hyper. So, this is a state of constant elevated blood pressure. And I believe that the cutoff point that your textbook offers is 140 over 90 milligrams of mercury. And of course, anything above that. And we try to catch the hypertension before it becomes medically and diagnostically significant. And we try to prevent the patient from developing this. So why hypertension is dangerous then, you might ask? Well, an individual with a hypertension has a greater risk of heart failure, vasculature diseases, renal failure. This makes sense as the kidneys filter the blood and an elevated risk of a stroke. Let's see how this also results in anatomical changes in the heart and organ that we just studied in our last chapter. Well, on hypertension patients, the heart muscle ends up having to work harder and the myocardium becomes larger in size, functioning weaker and also just flabby. Of course, there is also a risk of the plaque building up. Some of the risk factors associated with the hypertension include hereditary factors, diet that is high in fat and cholesterol, obesity, age, diabetes, stress, and smoking. Often there is no clear cause, but rather this may be a multifactorial, and we will never be able to pinpoint it to one particular reason. So, what can you do to reduce your risk of hypertension? Well, some things that you can do are, for example, lowering the amount of salt in the diet, amount of fat, and also cholesterol intake. Exercising more, losing some weight, and stopping smoking. So, lifestyle changes. And of course, if those do not help, or to assist with those pharmaceutical interventions. Now, I want to talk about another kind of blood pressure issue in hypotension instead. The blood pressure is lower than normal. A cutoff here is given as 90 over 60 milligrams of mercury. Do notice that this is not usually a significant issue, so we would rather deal with this than with a too high blood pressure. When it becomes a problem, in medical sense, I guess is when there is an insufficient blood supply to the tissues due to a low blood pressure. Then this would be definitely becoming an issue. 
Some have even suggested that this may be beneficial and in some findings suggests a link with a long like expectancy and a lack of cardiovascular illnesses. There are those subgroups of hypertension that I want to discuss about that. And why don't we have a look at those now? In temporarily low blood pressure, an individual may be feeling dizzy when suddenly standing up or reclining in a seat. In chronic hypertension, instead, there is often a link with poor nutrition. Alternatively, this might be an indication of a risk of developing other conditions. And finally, in acute hypertension, there is another reason for the loss of blood pressure. Usually, it is an indicator of a patient going into a shock. And I just wanted to remind you of the signs and symptoms of a shock. So an individual would appear pale, have cold and clammy skin, show as having a fast and shallow breathing, and or fast and weak pulse, appear agitated, and be possibly thirsty. And all of these would be signs that the individual might be heading into a shock. So how do we treat someone who is going into a shock? Lay them down so that they do not fall from high if they do go into it. Raise their feet in order to direct more blood to the head. Loosen any tight constricting clothing. Calm down the patient and monitor their progress. And of course, we want to treat the cause, whatever is taking the patient into a shock. One common cause for going into shock would be a loss of large amount of blood. Okay, I think that we are now ready to shift our focus on how we control blood flow in the body. Remember that the flow is constantly controlled and adjusted so that the rate of flow is exactly correct for the particular organ or a structure and its needs. And there are extrinsic and intrinsic controls that play a role. Let's have a look at those. So extrinsic controls rely on sympathetic nervous system and hormones that control the blood flow. And note that this level of control would act through the entire body. So for example, the smooth muscle on the arterioles could be affected by the sympathetic nervous system and hormones in order to direct blood to or away from certain areas, depending on if they need or do not need more blood flow. And then our intrinsic control is all about responding to local needs through controlling capillaries. So we are responding to specific tissues requirements at that site, only at that site. So capillaries can be modified on an organ level responding to their needs. And I think that this is a great illustration of this. See how normally about 20% of blood is directed to the skeletal muscles, but this amount can grow about 70% during exercise. Another one to consider is the brain. The blood flow to there is constant as the neurons die easily, as you learned in our mod modules on the nervous system. The brain really cannot handle too high or too low blood pressures, so we have a special adaptations to insert that. And then let's mention also skin. Skin has a very responsive adaptation to control the blood flow to and from it. This is because it plays such a major role in thermoregulation. And I should also mention that the skin is a major blood reservoir.
Next, lungs. Lungs require a low blood pressure as they cannot handle high pressure. With all the capillaries that are only equipped with a very, very thin wall. So we have a low blood pressure there. Finally, the heart. Well, we have already talked about it in our previous module. Now I want to talk quickly about the speed of flow at different parts. Let's have a look of that a little bit. And what we end up noticing is that the speed of flow depends on different parts of the systemic circuit. And I have a really nice diagram to illustrate this. Right here. So what we see is that the speed is fastest at the aorta and slowest at the capillaries. Interestingly, the speed slightly increases again in the veins. Why would this happen, you might ask? Well, the speed actually depends on the cross-sectional area as shown on this diagram that we have here. Notice how the largest cross-sectional area of the vessels is at the capillaries. So the blood speed slows down here as well. And this is, of course, useful for us as since it facilitates the exchange of materials here. We have already talked about pre-capillary sphincters in our earlier videos of this chapter. So I will leave it for now on this topic and just refer you back to those videos. Just note that they control the blood flow through capillaries. I will mention though a few points about capillary exchange. So the exchange can happen by simple diffusion Remember, this was the movement of material down the concentration gradient. So in this example, picture the food color put in one corner of the glass slowly spreads evenly to all of the content of the glass. Or some of the exchange can happen to fenestrations. Remember, these were the little window-like structures at the walls of the capillaries. Or it could be due to active transport. This is where we use either various pumps or vesicles to transport larger molecules across. Do note that on a larger scale, the total movement of fluids in and out of the blood vessels should be balanced. And these two forces were called our osmotic and hydrostatic pressure. So let's bring in a clinical relevance to this. Well, an edema is what happens when there is more fluid leaving the vessel than getting reabsorbed. So think of the diagram that we just saw about the balance of osmotic and hydrostatic pressures. And the edemans can have problematic, be problematic beyond just swelling. So we need to be mindful of those. And what is the underlying reason behind those? There are a few important points that I want to highlight before we wrap up this video. Firstly, do note that as a rule of thumb, the arteries run deep in the body. This makes sense if you think about it. This way they are maximally protected from being injured or cut, resulting in a rapid loss of large volumes of blood. Then also note that especially the veins that have adaptations of having many alternative routes. This is useful if there is, for example, a blockage somewhere along the way. And finally, note that the brain and intestine have unique venous drainage arrangement. And especially that, 
the nutrient-rich blood from the intestines goes first to the liver in order for the energy to get stored. And this is where we will wrap up this chapter's lecture video material. I would like you to take a moment to review the special circulations though, and therefore I have provided some excellent diagrams for you to study in your learning management system. Please give them a good look. I thank you for sticking with me on this study material for this chapter, and as I said earlier, this chapter completes our study of the cardiovascular system. So, next week we will move on to something different.